Ah, the pool season. And all of the maintenance and repairs that go along with it. This here is a summit, which has now been taken over by Hayward. Heat pump, thermal pump. It's basically an air conditioning unit in reverse. It is extracting heat from the atmosphere and dumping it into the pool. So it's heating your pool in that sense. When it's working in your house, it's taking... Fucking bird, Jesus. It's taking the heat out of the house and dumping it outside. It's moving around the thermal energy. And it does that by phase changing a gas. It can be any gas, but... They use specific ones. So anyways, that's a, that's a whole other thing. Over here we have the, the coil, which is CPVC, chlorinated polyvinyl chloride. It's gray stuff. And this is what absorbs the thermal energy from the compressor. This appears to be a scroll compressor. There's a TXV valve over here. There's the high and low ports. Jesus, man, this bird! Inside here is all of the uh, fuckery that goes along with the control circuits. We have this panel over here, and I will be getting the rifle very shortly. This is the transformer for the coil of the contactor. This is the low pressure switch, the high pressure switch. With the fan. And we have the run capacitors, or the start capacitors for the fan and the compressor, respectively. We have the pressure sensor switch. And that's really it. There's not much to it. It's a very simple system, and they all kind of work the same. Only different. The first most common problem you'll have is no flow. Now, the reason that happens is because, as it tells you, there's no flow. Your pump is clogged, your filter is clogged. If you have a variable speed pump, it's running at too low of a speed and it's not pushing enough water through this to activate this pressure sensor switch over here. You can also have a leak in this tube. This tube can be broken, it can be disconnected, it can be clogged. It comes up here and it connects to the pipe way in the back. And all of this does is it pushes a little plunger or diaphragm in here up against a micro switch and closes the contact to tell it that there's water running through this thing so it doesn't burn itself out. These can go bad. They often do. Hayward wants to sell you this entire assembly. As you can see the switch is riveted in there. You can go about that route, take this whole thing off. There's a nut here that's holding it in. It's probably going to cost you somewhere about a hundred bucks, or you can go to the electronics store, you can grab one of these. They have three terminals on them, you can see one is capped, that's because you have a normally open and a normally closed. This one uses the normally open, so when the switch is not depressed, the circuit is open. And when the circuit is completed, or when the switch is depressed, it is closed. So you can see that's why they use that one there. You gotta make sure you hook it up to the right one. Otherwise, when it closes, it's gonna open the circuit. It's gonna do the opposite of what you want. You take this thing out, you grind these off with the Dremel. You put in a new one, and you put in some screws or some rivets. And you've just saved yourself uh, a considerable amount of money. Contactors go bad, for whatever reason. The, uh, the plungers here, they become all, um, all uh, what do you call it, carbonized and corroded from making and breaking contact, the coil goes out, the low voltage transformer which powers the coil can crap out. It sends a 24 volt signal to the coil which closes the contactor like that, engaging the fan and the compressor. There's a cover that goes over here, I, I removed it, the screws actually snapped right off because they're so rusted. My multimeter beeping at me. Uh, one of the lugs actually broke off because it was so corroded and you can see I kind of cheated it with a copper bonding lug just so that I can get this thing going to make sure that it actually worked. So it's something you want to you do want to be mindful of. Uh, there, there's obviously no power coming into here. If there was you don't want to be sticking your hands around here for obvious reasons. 
um, but your two power wires will come through here. It's a 220 volt system, so you have one line of 110 and 110. You have your ground over here, there's no neutral. And that's how that works. So you can remove this cover and with an insulated uh, pair of needle nose pliers or an insulated screwdriver, you push these down and you'll bypass all of the control circuitry and you're sending power straight through to the fan and the compressor and you're turning everything on. That's what you're doing. That can rule out everything downstream of the contactor. Again, if you take Hayward's part number, you're going to be paying more for the part because they're, they're giving you the right part that they've slapped their part number on and they're charging a premium for it. You can use any 24 volt coil contactor that's rated for 30 amps. Take this guy out, reattach the wires, that's it. You can check voltage from the transformer to make sure that it's actually putting out the correct amount of voltage. You can simply put 24 volts on the contactor and see if it closes because the control circuit has to tell this to do what it's supposed to do. You can check the capacitors for the fan and the compressor. Any multimeter with a capacitance setting or a specific capacitance tester will allow you to check these and see if they're within specification. They'll, they'll never give you exactly the microfarad rating. It'll be a little bit off, but as long as it's pretty close there and it's not shorted out. Do be careful when you're playing with these, especially if the thing's just been running, because these can contain uh, quite a powerful charge in them. Uh, we talked about capacitors, talked about the contactor. Um, the control circuitry itself can crap out. I see a nice, big, beautiful electrolytic capacitor. These love to, uh, to swell and explode. If this guy looks puffy or the, the electrolyte is pissing out the top or the bottom, you're going to have to take this off and replace it. I haven't seen that on any of these units, but it is common uh, for electrolytic capacitors in general sense. You do have a plan over here, or a wiring schematic, which tells you where everything goes. And this particular unit is having a low pressure problem. So it thinks that there's low pressure uh, on the low pressure or suction side of the unit. This thing has been off for quite a while, so the pressure should be the same. It should equalize. The error code coming up is LP for low pressure. The proper thing to do is get a uh, manifold gauge set, which I don't have the luxury of having, and we hook it on here and we see if we're getting the right amount of pressure. This here is the low pressure sensor switch. And we can see that in the open position, it'll open at uh, 25 PSI or below, and it should be closed at 50 PSI or above. This thing was a little bit stiff on here. Be mindful of that, it just screws on. You don't want to twist or bend this too much because you're going to 1000% cause a leak if it doesn't already have one. So if our pressures are within range, then we want to remove this part. I'm going to show you how to test it. The blue wires come here into the cabinet. I've stuck my multimeter leads into the, uh, into the spade connectors. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot compressed air into this and see if it closes. So I'm going to take my multimeter. I'm going to put it on continuity like that. Try and set the camera down here. See what I'm doing. Mind frame. Okay, so here's the switch. You may be able to hear it clicking. So you can see that when I put air through it, it's making contact. The switch works, there's nothing wrong with the switch. Try and get the camera closer, see if you can hear the, the clicking inside of it. There's nothing wrong with the switch. So that means we suspect a leak here. Now, if I take my probe and I push in on this Schrader valve, that's not 100 PSI of refrigerant coming out of there. 
So this unit is toast. You can fix these. Uh, the way to do that is with leak detection uh, and so on and so forth. Leaks can be very evasive. There could be multiple leaks. Uh, generally speaking, it is not worth it to to do that kind of repair, and you would just go and replace the unit. Um, if you do go through all of that, there's another leak at a, at a later point. You've just wasted all that time and money. That's more of a specialized practice that will be done by an HVAC technician who has either A, a sniffer that can sniff out where the refrigerant is pissing through. You can do it with a leak-detecting spray like that, the uh, super blue or big blue stuff it's a micro leak detector you spray it around all of the joints and you see where the bubblies are coming from the best thing is usually to inject a uv dye into there recharge it let it run and then you go around checking it with an ultraviolet light and some orange glasses and you see um, the, the finest leak of where that dye is leaking from so unfortunately this unit is probably going to be toast if we were getting the right pressure and the switch was bad, we would simply go ahead and replace the switch. Again, you can just take the part number of this and go about getting it on Flea Bay, the Amazon, or a local um, HVAC uh, parts supply house. Or you can take the Hayward part number and you're going to pay a little bit of a premium to get this part with the Hayward part number. But because this unit has a leak somewhere, it's pretty much done for. I'm going to take it down for parts. It's going to serve way more value in parts than uh, it would be to, to fix this unit and, and replace it. But those are just some of the most common issues that you're going to come across in diagnosing your unit. And maybe you can get yours to work. If you have any questions, leave a comment. Let me know and I'll get back to you.